Hello, everyone. My name is Dee McKenzie, and I'm an education consultant in the Center of Education Services at RTI International. Now, in my role, I have a primary focus in the areas of leadership and equity. Now, if it's okay with you, I would like to take a brief moment to share what it is that we do as a, as a center. So, we provide technical assistance for educators in the following areas. Uh, strategic consulting, leadership development, instructional support, and the facilitation of collaborative education networks. Now, our team consists of former educators who have served in the classroom as teachers, at the school and district level as administrators, as, as well as leadership and consulting positions at the state level. Now, my colleagues and I, we draw on our experience back with research. Now, that's important. Now, and we use that research and, and our experience to support schools and districts in addressing their most pressing priorities and complex challenges. Now, we are passionate about the work that we do. And that work is to ensure that all students have access to a quality education. And, and I will make the assumption that there are several of us on this call, if not all, that believe that that is the right of every student. And hence the topic centered around the impact of COVID-19 reshaping the upcoming school year. I mean, what does that look like? And more importantly, what are the steps we will take in addressing this dilemma and producing the most beneficial outcome that is equitable for all? Now, needless to say, many educators are finishing an educational triage this school year as, as we find ourselves forced into emergency remote learning mode. And, and the work yet continues. There are school dates that have already been set in August, and, and I say that optimistically, uh, <laughs> just thinking about the fact that the time needle is forever changing for stabilizing the spread of the virus. And, and as you may know from experience, hopefully you will hear today the efforts and productive struggle of educators and leaders, strategically thinking about what school reentry looks like in the 2020-21 school year. Now, honestly, I'm impressed with the proactiveness of districts throughout the country coming together to work collaboratively to devise solutions and, and design structures that, that meet the needs of all students. And no differently, this is the intent of today's webinar. Now, if you're like me, I look forward to getting into the heads of our panelists and hearing some logistics around reopening school buildings for face-to-face -face instruction, as, as well as remote learning and, and, and blended options. In addition, I, I hope you glean from the knowledge and experience of our panelists and, and gain a lot of insight from the discussion to support your respective plans. So, without further delay, uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our moderator for, for today. She has an experienced background working as a teacher leader, and I don't say that lightly, at both the elementary and middle school level. She has also served as an educator, excuse me, an education program specialist for the North Carolina State Board of Education. Now, I am proud to call her my colleague, and here's why. She has a passion for advancing equity in education from the classroom to the boardroom and beyond. And with that said, I will turn it over to my colleague, Allison Redding. Allison? Thank you so much, Dee. I so appreciate your comments around the webinar, and I appreciate that very kind um, introduction. I'm not crying. You're crying. It's fine. Um, but I want to say to everyone who is listening in and watching, thank you so much for being here. Um, I do encourage you, if you are engaging with us um, on social media, specifically on Twitter, uh, you can find um, Twitter handles on this slide for the panelists. 
myself and the larger Center for Education Services. Um, we do ask that if you are going to be tweeting about our panelists' webinar or our panelists' comments and our webinar as a whole, to please use the hashtag RTICESLearns to continue the conversation. Um, I'm really excited because we have a lot of different folks listening in. We have parents, we have school folks like teachers, principals, we have district folks like CAOs and superintendents on the call. We have just this huge array of people. And I think that's going to make our conversation really rich um, and it'll make the question and answer time that we have at the end of this webinar, I think particularly interesting given so many perspectives that we have on the call today. Um, to further contextualize this conversation, I um, wanna bring up that um, there was a recent survey that was a national survey that asked folks, asked Americans how they feel about schools reopening in the fall and over 50%, I think it was 54% of American respondents said that they are somewhat or very uncomfortable with this idea of reopening schools, which is completely understandable. And so um, Shane, if you can go on to the next slide, I want to give the panelists an opportunity to introduce themselves briefly. Um, and they're also going to answer a uh, introduction question and that introduction question we encourage you all listening in to also answer that question in the chat box so the introduction question is when you think about school reentry what is top of mind for you right now and I think given again this wide array of folks listening in there are going to potentially be a very wide wide array of responses to that question as well. So um, we'll start out with an introduction from Dr. LaShawn Glasgow. Thank you, Allison. Hello, everyone. I'm LaShawn Glasgow, and I am the director of RTI's Community and Workplace Health Program. Um, and Allison, to answer that question, I would say um, equity is top of mind uh, for me right now when it comes to COVID-19 response, including um, school reentry, um, and that's because we know we've we've seen the data that um, people with low incomes and people of color are disproportionately burdened uh, by COVID-19 in terms of hospitalizations and deaths. We know that these COVID-19 inequities kind of come right on top of some other uh, inequities that we see in the health system and the education system. So, as we respond to COVID-19. Um, what concerns me, frankly, is, is the potential for this moment to um, really thwart the well-being of whole groups of our population. Um, and as much as I'm concerned about that, um, and it keeps me up at night, um, I also find myself hopeful, right, um, that with the visibility of COVID-19 and how wide-reaching it is, that this could be a moment um, that really kind of propels us as a nation to kind of create a more equitable society. Great, Christina. Hi everyone, my name is Christina Ishmael and I'm the Director of Primary and Secondary Education for a nonprofit called Open Education Global. I'm also a Senior Research Fellow for Education Policy Program at New America. Um, when I am thinking about school reentry um, to kind of build off of what LaShawn mentioned as far as like safety, healthy um, health, um, as well as equity, I'm also thinking a lot about teachers. Um, as a former classroom teacher of early childhood and elementary, I think of um, young ones, our youngest learners, our most um, vulnerable populations, um, as well as those kids in transition years. Um, but I'm, I'm thinking about uh, the teachers that are going to be teaching them and the professional learning that is needed for them to successfully execute whatever the model may look like um, back in their school systems. So I'm thinking a lot about teacher friends right now and hearing about some of the district plans that are coming out and what that might actually mean implemented and in practice. Great, and Dr. Brown. Yes, uh, hello everybody. My name is Kevin Brown. I'm the executive director 
for the Texas Association of School Administrators. Uh, I'm a former teacher and principal and school superintendent uh, and 30 years in education. And I would have to agree with uh, both panelists. I think those are very important uh, uh, issues that we need to be thinking through as we approach uh, our school year. And I think, uh, I think our, our society has gone through a pretty significant trauma. Uh, and that includes our students, especially our most vulnerable students. It includes our educators, also includes our leaders. Um, and so as we go into the new year, I'm thinking of how we need to make sure that every single person in our schools feels connected and important and valued in what they do. I think uh, learning starts with a relationship between a, a student and a teacher. So how do we get our teachers to feel like they can be at school in a safe way or to be uh, teaching uh, remotely in a safe way. And if we do that, how do we make sure that we connect with students on a very personal level so they feel that connectedness? Uh, because I think we're in for the long haul here and, and we gotta make sure we're taking care of everybody. Great, thank you so much for answering our introduction question. Um, Shane, if you could, um, turn us over into gallery mode. That would be delightful. Thank you so much. Um, so the first question that I have um, for Dr. Brown is um, you work with, you mentioned that you work with Texas school administrators, and I'm kind of curious if there are specific buckets of concern that school administrators have right now in these conversations around reentry. Yeah, so there's there's several concerns. One of which I just addressed, which is the social emotional aspect, and 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 not only for our educators and our students, but also the the leaders who are going through there here, because every single decision they make is controversial. Whether it's graduation, whether it's grading policies, whether it's wearing a mask or not wearing a mask, or whatever that is, these are really difficult, controversial uh, things to have happen. So there's the social emotional wellness of kind of everybody that's involved. Uh, another uh, serious aspect that we're looking at is, is providing in-person learning uh, when possible, when safe, and for those who want to do it. Um, but also, how do you do remote learning in a way that, uh, that, that, is, uh, that works well, that engages students, that makes sure that there's equity uh, for every student. Uh, we especially have concerns around accessibility, um, uh, internet capacity, and those uh, kinds of issues. Uh, we're working on a, a very big idea uh, in the state of making sure that there is accessibility in every home in the state of Texas. Obviously, that's expensive and doesn't happen overnight. Um, another one is, is funding. Um, we are obviously in an economic crisis. Our country is in an economic crisis. Um, I don't believe we will have an American economic recovery without a uh, public education recovery. Uh, we have got to fund public schools through this crisis. We can't lose a generation of children uh, because of the economic downturn. And this will be a challenging time because everybody's going to be wanting to cut funding um, it for, uh, for some very valid reasons. But this is one area that needs to remain untouched. Uh, I'm worried a little bit about a loss of enrollment in schools as people decide that neither in-person is great or remote learning. Um, and so uh, those are all considerable issues. The last one is, and I have a whole lot more, but I'll just say one more, which is that uh, uh, in order for schools to function, our staff has to be able to feel like they can come to work and be safe. Um, and, and so that requires a lot of thinking about uh, social distancing, about PPEs, about uh, uh, what kinds of things we can do, because especially with our, our older teachers or our uh, at-risk, uh, vulnerable uh, folks, um, we don't want to lose our educators uh, in the midst of this as they're trying to serve our children. And so we have to invest in our people uh, because schools won't be open without teachers and principals. And so how do we make sure that they can do that? And, and then how do we set expectations uh, for parents about uh, how we can help them, but also what is possible and what is not possible uh, through this? We're in for challenging times. 
And, uh, uh, and I think we've gotten off to this marathon by sprinting. The last three or four months we've been sprinting and now we are realizing this is a marathon and we've got to pace ourselves and give each other some grace and patience and love as we get through this pandemic together. Great. Um, thank you so much. Something that you said about uh, at the end of your response with looking at staff, making sure that they feel safe coming back into school, talking about parents as well. I want to ask you, Dr. Glasgow, kind of how you and your line of work with public health and communities and the workforce, um, how do you or how are you thinking about schools as a larger part of the community and how that plays a role in the reentry plans that people are talking about? Sure, Allison, and I think um, Kevin really hit on the critical points here. Um, that we, you know, as you said, we can kind of think about schools as workplaces, um, and so staff safety is really critical. Um, so when we're thinking about workplace health, we are talking about the safety protocols that come to mind that Kevin talked about, the distancing, the face coverings, the hand washing. Um, there's also training and education uh, related to COVID-19 risks and mitigation strategies, um, having communication protocols in place um, so that teachers and staff feel comfortable raising issues and raising concerns, and um, also having communication protocols in place that respect the privacy of staff um, is really important um, from a workplace health perspective. Um, and then, of course, having those feedback loops and monitoring and evaluation, as Kevin said, we, we started off with you know, a marathon with a sprint, which means we have a lot to learn. Um, so we need to make sure that we have protocols in place to gather information and, get, and gather feedback as we go along to help make sure that we're meeting the needs of teachers and staff. Um, I think those are a lot of the supports that kind of immediately come to mind, but I just want to point out kind of a principle from um, community health and workplace health is how important engagement is. Um, so, you know, we're kind of asking the question, what do staff, what do teachers, what do principals need to be able to, um, you know, walk out the reentry protocols as planned? And so that's the question we should really ask them um, and engage them and discussion around um, to the extent feasible. Um, and also thinking broadly of support, um, you know, we talked about this a little bit earlier, COVID-19 is taking a heavier toll on some groups of people. And so there's the potential for it also to be taking a heavier toll on certain staff members. You know, Kevin pointed out those with underlying conditions may have uh, special concerns. Um, but we also know that with COVID-19, we're seeing um, increased uh, racism, um, and attacks against Asian Americans, so that could be a particular group. Um, and also, as we talked before, uh, low income, folks with low income and racial and ethnic minorities. So I think it's important to continue to engage staff and, and, um, and ask them what it is they need. Be transparent. Um, like Kevin said, we're not going to have an answer that's going to be a magic solution for everyone. But continue that engagement and being very intentional about making sure um, we're engaging uh, folks from those special groups who may, you know, be experiencing a heavier toll. Um, something else that Kevin mentioned um, specifically around the in-person learning versus remote learning. Christina, I know you have a lot of experience um, working with open education resources. Um, that's part of <laughs> the main part of your job, I feel like, that you're currently in at Open Education Global. And you also spent some time not too long ago writing a kind of pandemic planning, scenario planning document with some of your colleagues or your former colleagues at New America. And I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about what some of those scenarios look like and how, you know, <laughs> schools and districts can balance the in-person and remote components to school reentry. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I would like to say that, first of all, I don't have the answers. <laughs> and, our, and my co-authors did not have the answers either, but we had a lot of questions. 
Um, so my co-authors were two friends from grad school who are in various positions. Um, Rebecca Heiser is an instructional designer for Penn State World Campus and helps faculty members as they transition to full online learning. And Jenny Payne is a director of professional learning and kind of technology for a blended high school um, that is now expanding into a middle school that's part of a public school system outside of Denver, Colorado. And so she has a full understanding of what this looks like. And then also coming from a previous district that had a full K-12 blended school. So she can talk about the logistics of this. And it started with a, a quarantine check-in. Um, I was telling them that a lot of folks that had reached out to me were using terminology kind of interchangeably, saying distance learning or crisis whatever learning or uh, remote learning. And so we, we started with the terminology because distance education has a history, um, well over 100 years at this point with correspondence courses and things like that that you may have heard of um, long before the internet. Um, and so that was really important for us to kind of define those things. And luckily, we didn't even have to do that. I, Nicole, which is now the Aurora Institute, had a project defin or excuse me, a definition project from 2012 that further defined all of these things. And so what we were able to identify was that this is crisis distance learning. Um, because it's not planned by any means and it's very low fidelity uh, and but necessary obviously here we are um, and then talked about some potential scenarios that we saw in the fall uh, and that you know kind of thinking about again low fidelity to more high fidelity low fidelity being the click to brick scenario which is really about um, like going back and then if you are mirroring things online through some sort of learning management system or online platform um, that you could quickly pivot to that distance learning environment, like much like we have um, this past spring, but then having a little more uh, training in order to do so. Then we have, uh, excuse me, brick to click, which is, uh, excuse me, that was brick to click, click to brick, I get these confused, um, is where all content is being delivered online. But then if we are allowed to go back in person, really focusing on those relationships. So making sure that they have some sort of advisory and that they can do any sort of additional um, support services that need to be done in, or in person. And then more of the high fidelity is the blended learning and talking about what options may look like, whether that is bringing kids in one day a week and staggering that, um, and then full online learning. And we also recognize that it's very difficult to do that with vulnerable populations as well as our youngest learners. Um, independence is not something that we have a lot of in pre-K through second grade, really. And so even up through fifth grade, really. So could we ask the elementary students and the early childhood students to come back in person more often, um, but then have our, our older students, our secondary students, continue to do things online? So I appreciate you sharing the link to the report. Um, we've had a number of views of it. And again, no answers necessarily, but lots of questions to hopefully spark conversations um, with districts and, and kind of team leaders, as well as uh, their community partners and hopefully parents and students as part of that. Um, I want to jump into some questions that are open to, to any of the panelists right now. Um, and, you know, I think it's safe to say that the pandemic has really changed the, the learning landscape uh, for this upcoming school year and probably forever. Um, and I'm just curious, how can educators make certain that social and economic inequities don't hold them back? I'll just um, jump in here, Allison, to say um, uh, that I, I, I don't want to, let's not put that on you know, let's let's all take accountability and responsibility for that, right? So, you know, how can teachers make sure? I, I think, um, you know, society is is being called a little higher here, right? Not not just teachers. Um, I, I think, you know, we keep in mind what are we requiring of our teachers in this, right? Um, and is that fair, considering the resources mm -hmm. that we're providing them with? Um, so that's the question, but what are we requiring of our parents and students and families? And is that they are given where they're coming from and, and, and everything they're grappling with? So, um, you know, com community health, from the community health side, I mean, I think there's a real, um, as I mentioned before, this is a moment for our society, right? We have a lot 
that goes into our policies, how uh, related to education funding, related to job security, related to healthcare access. And in this moment, we're seeing um, all of our missteps and all of our shortcomings in terms of our policies and society are, are really mixing with this COVID-19 moment. Um, and really, as we talked about before, um, thwarting the well-being of whole groups of, of society. So I do think we, there are strengths in communities. So I think we have a role in um, working through partnerships, community partners, the, their strengths in schools, um, the expertise of teachers and administrators, all that certainly can be brought to bear. Um, and also, you know, parents and, and their engagement can be brought to bear. Um, but I think we also um, have a role of um, putting these issues um, forward um, to decision makers um, and, and kind of pushing for the kinds of changes that are going to be important so that um, we're better prepared for the next COVID-19 or the next national disaster, the next public health crisis. Because if we don't fix some things now, we collectively, um, you know, we're going to be back in, in this situation um, in the future. Um, so, you know, that, that would be my answer that, to that question. I don't know if Christina or Kevin have, have anything to add. I think the only thing that I would add to that is um, I was on a call last week uh, with Christine Fox, the deputy director of CEDA, which is the State Ed Tech Directors Association. And they were able to identify that 13 states already had policies for virtual learning days. Um, and so they already had the policies that afforded them to be able to do things online where it would still count for credit and that it would still count for attendance or whatever that may, whatever that may be as far as counting. And we have the potential of really thinking about how we can expand that in other states and other policies that would allow that to happen so that um, we're not forced to, you know, or be, be held into the, uh, the Carnegie unit and the seat time and all of those things that are preventing several districts right now and several states for that matter um, to really have to force themselves to think about going back in person. I taught in Omaha, Nebraska. I worked at the Nebraska Department of Education. They actually don't allow that as part of their policy. And so um, what is that going to look like in the, in the fall? We don't know yet. And so it's been interesting to kind of follow along in that state. Um, and I know that other states are facing that as well. Yeah, I'll, uh, I agree with both Christina and Dr. Glasgow. I think that, you know, uh, if you think about public education in America for the last uh, century or more, it has been uh, built on the industrial model, a factory model of schooling, where essentially we tried to treat everybody as if they were the same. Um, and, and we stamped them out as the same. They go through this, you know, one grade level, one period of the day to the next. We even have bells, right? And, and, uh, and, and our, even our calendar is, is antiquated in many ways. And we've been fighting that for a really long time to try to make education more personalized, uh, more customized to every individual child. Uh, recognizing their strengths, uh, their talents, their passions. Uh, and I think many inequities have occurred and have been revealed in the limitation of a system like that. Now, many of us on this call today probably did well in that system, actually. Um, but that doesn't mean it serves everybody well. And so, you know, every time our country's gone through a major crisis, um, and we never want a crisis. We don't want this. So I don't want to take away from how terrible this is. Um, but we've been pushing for a new vision for public education that, that is more student-centered and, and, and is more equitable. And so although this has revealed those inequities uh, in a much greater way than we've ever seen before, or at least seen in a long time, I think there's opportunity that we might come out of this in a way that our students are much better prepared at, at dealing with the needs uh, of individual students, individual communities, um, and, and recognizing that within that diversity in our communities is a lot of strength. And, and instead of trying to treat every child the same, and having an assessment and accountability system that demands that, maybe we can break out of that uh, insanity to try to uh, recognize that learning 
ought to be inspiring, challenging, it ought to be deep, um, and it ought to recognize where that learner is at that given time, and then provide the wraparound resources that they need to be successful in whatever way uh, they can. And that might look different um, for different people depending on what direction they're wanting to go. And so, um, I, you know, I don't have all the answers, but maybe in this crisis, there's an opportunity for us to come out of this as a stronger and better uh, place for everybody. So I'm still sitting with something, uh, LaShawn, that you mentioned in your response to that question around um, how society as a whole has to rise to the occasion more or less. And I'm curious what it could look like to, or for schools and families and the larger community to work together to kind of realign expectations about education, to realign um, needs for their own communities and what that could potentially look like moving forward. So I'll just chime in real quick, uh, and, uh, uh, but you know, if, if I had my druthers, and, and I, we did this when I was a superintendent in, in San Antonio, is we took, and it was more of a process than a product, but it's a little bit of both, but we went through the process of defining a profile of a learner. Um, what are the characteristics and attributes that our community would love for our children to have? What, what, what do our children uh, want? How do we listen to children? How do we listen to parents? Um, how do we then think as designers of experiences uh, that result in profound learning, not superficial learning, not a mile wide and an inch deep learning, uh, but learning that challenges our thinking and gets us to really ponder important questions and come up with our own voice on what the answers to those are. Um, when you have a profile of a learner, then you start looking at a broader context, how do we assess and how do we demonstrate that we're accountable to our community for things like character, for things like uh, being accepting and having tolerance of others and respecting different cultures. How do we show uh, uh, critical thinking skills and creativity and all of these kind and, and people skills and all these soft skills and hard skills that are important to be out in the work world. And then how do we turn that away, uh, turn that around and show the community what we're doing? That's the product part of it, but the, it's the process that engages the community to determine what it is that they're hoping for, for everybody. And then it's, it's a nice circle to be able to provide. And, but that requires different data points. Yes, you can have assessment and accountability, but that should be one portion of it, not the entire piece. There's much more complex work that schools do. And, uh, and, and we need to, to demonstrate that, share that with the community, celebrate successes when they happen, uh, but also own up to the shortcomings that we have. And I think right now, a lot of schools and a lot of communities have really come to terms in maybe a different way than they have in a long time about things like racism and equity, uh, that yes, there's been a lot of talk and yes, there's been a lot of discussion um, and yes, we've moved forward as a country in many ways, uh, but we keep taking steps back, and yet we still have not fulfilled uh, our uh, promise of the American dream for everybody. And until we do that, uh, I think we have to be thinking in terms of how we engage our communities much more differently. And by the way, that process requires school leaders to listen. Listen to children listen to teachers, listen to parents, um, and then help facilitate and collaborate what that answer is. And I think that's where true leadership is today, is really being more of a listener um, than anything. All right, well, I just wanna take a pause for a second to see if um, LaShawn, you or Christina had anything else you wanted to add before I kick us off with our first panelist question. No, I don't wanna slow us down. 
to the question and answer. All right. Thanks, Allison. All right. Great. Okay. So um, the first question that we have from um, the audience is what kind of policy responses would you like to see resulting from the COVID-19 crisis? So many, so, so many. Uh, <laughs> one of the very first things, well, no, it, there are so many, but one of the things that come top of mind right now for me is um, advocacy and changes around uh, E-rate funding from the FCC. And the reason I mentioned that is because the E-rate was modernized in 2015, which then allowed expansion on how we could actually get funding to fund broadband connectivity. Um, however, we know that there will be some sort of model as far as distance learning or blended learning moving forward. And we would love for school districts to be able to help support students at home with getting connectivity. And so that is going to require changes from the FCC in that whole process. So that is like one huge policy thing that we can help advocate for right now and that I would push for us to do. I also, again, working at the federal and then at the state level, um, I, at the state level, we like to use local control as an excuse for everything, unfortunately, which is good and bad sometimes. Um, but I really think that like our state agencies have to provide more guidance on things and just give us some clear directions um, and, and then allow folks to be able to implement that how they see fit for their communities. But we really need some additional guidance coming from state. We won't worry about the federal level with overreach and all of that, but I, I really I'm seeing some plans that are coming out from different states and some of them are really great. And then some of them are just kind of like, here you go and do as you will. And that's not really helpful either right now. And so um, some, some stronger leadership, I think in, in all of that would be helpful right now. So there's a, I would agree with uh, uh, Christine on there. I think that the uh, policy wise, uh, there's there's policies around health and safety, obviously that that uh, uh, we need to look at, and uh, uh, even at, you know in Texas we still fund based on seat time and average daily attendance, and and we essentially turn our teachers into attendance clerks, uh, and 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 there's a lot of wasted time and effort that goes into that, uh, and even more so in the uh, current situation because in order to get funding, we're having to justify where people are getting their, their money and so forth. Um, you know, policy things down the road, I, I would like to see us break out of the way that we think about funding schools uh, based on seat time, based on in-class time, and allow students to be doing much more learning outside of the school building, um, uh, doing internships, externships, uh, uh, and those kinds of things, uh, being able to learn remotely if and when uh, it works uh, for students and I think it's different for different students and and uh, uh, and 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 looking that a little bit differently and I'm gonna, on, are there any I was thinking, yeah go ahead I had one little piece here and I'm sorry and that is this no it's fine during a crisis, uh, we turn towards uh, our institutions. And one, I don't know if it's a policy change, but it's definitely an advocacy change, which is people have turned to their schools because they're the cornerstone of their community. Um, they, you know, when there's a hurricane, and which we get a lot in Texas, or there's a pandemic or whatever it may be, we all turn to our schools. We also turn to other institutions that are important to us, but we forget about them um, when things are going well. And I, I would like to see a, you know, Alexis de Tocqueville, when he came to America and studied democracy in America, said that it's provisions set forth for public education, which from the very first set into clearest relief the originality of American civilization. Um, although we haven't always educated everybody the way we should, uh, it is part of the American dream that we will educate everybody and that in doing so, we protect our republic. We protect our democracy. And, and I just wish that our society championed public education more, championed teachers more, uh, like other countries have come to do after we did. 
um, we were this is what made us uh, original. It's it, it's something that's uh, was unique to us to try to educate everybody, and uh, we're still evolving in that. But uh, uh, I would like to see us continue to advocate, 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 and champion our public schools. They're not perfect. It's easy to point out the bad things, but we also ought to champion the good. Yeah, <clears throat> and I'll just add my two cents um, to that point is that an investment in education and in our public education um, is, a, in a, is an investment um, in health and the greater well-being of our society. You know, education is one of those uh, key drivers of health. Um, so we're talking about health issue and also how that impacts education. Um, in the same way COVID is exacerbating um, some of the issues that we have in, in our education system, um, as we come up with solutions or are pressed to come up with solutions through COVID-19, it's kind of helping to open our eyes to the links between education and health and how some changes we can make by investing in our education system, particularly our public education system, can, can have benefits, you know, far beyond education, you know, broader benefits for the society. Our second audience question. Um, all right, this one's a little longer. So, there was documented learning loss among many populations during the last quarter of the school year. This means that many students will be doing catch up even before they are ready to tackle next year's curriculum. Learning loss is not equally distributed, even though, or even among students who will be in the same classroom. What will this mean for teaching and learning this school year to come? Well, nobody else is unmuting, so uh, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. Man, that's a tough one. Uh, and I think it is the biggest question facing all of us. And it's not, a, there's, there, there is no one easy answer to this, but there is no doubt there's been learning loss. It's not equally distributed. Uh, I've, I've been very inspired by the work of a lot of school districts that have gone out. They're making they're making face-to-face -face visits. They're, they're connecting, even sometimes when there's not internet access, they're taking uh, buses out around the community to provide hot spots. Uh, they are doing one-on-one -on -one, uh, work with students who are our most vulnerable students. They're doing summer school work uh, where they're, they're bringing in the, the, uh, the neediest students and, and working with them in whatever way they can. They're doing drive-bys, they're doing all kinds of amazing things. Um, and, 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 the, and they're doing it uh, working 24-7. Um, and, and so this is going to be a struggle. Um, you know, it's not going to be a, a quick fix and, and I wish I had a magic wand to say it's gonna go away. Um, I think all of those efforts that people are doing, we have to shout from the rooftops and celebrate what they're doing and share best practices and those kinds of things. And, and we need to appreciate the people that are doing that uh, as much as we can. And we also need to, to look out for one another's uh, children and recognize that everybody's going through. There's a lot of people that are on this call today, I'm sure, that have children running around in the background. They're trying to mute their phone so nobody can hear. Uh, I had a doorbell ring in the middle of this. I have no idea what's going on at my house. Uh, so, you know, uh, we're all in this together and, this, and, this, and I'm in a good circumstance, right? I'm not having to hold down three jobs and, and be a single parent and do all those kinds of things. And so um, I, d I wish I had all the right answers to it, but uh, I, I think there's so many good things that are already going on and we need to just continue to share those and spread those good messages that are out there. And, and I'll just tell you this, I was a judge on the Texas Principal of the Year Awards and when we asked this question, how many of your students have you made contact with uh, since the pandemic began? And I was struck by how many said 100%. We've made contact with every single family. Uh, we, we, we have a plan to give wraparound services and, uh, and, and I don't know if that's the norm, uh, but but it is certainly admirable and ought to be celebrated. Um, but we're in for a challenge. 
I think um, I was on a webinar, uh, who knows, time, I don't know, um, NWEA, when they were talking about what that actually looks like as far as the learning loss is concerned. Um, and one of the things that Chris Minich was, was talking about was really around diagnostic assessments. And so how are we going to leverage diagnostic to see when students enter this new grade level, what they know or what they don't know? So as a former kindergarten teacher, I would have kind of my diagnostic to see letters, numbers, colors, things like that. Um, but mine was different than the teacher next door, than the teacher across the hall. And so how could we kind of standardize some of these diagnostics within a building, but within a school district, but then also between school districts? And I recognize that there is often competition if a student want to goes, wants to go to a different uh, school system then they the money follows them in some states. Um, but I think that this is a prime opportunity for folks to work together. Um, there are some federal policies and, and federal funding that encourage more of a consortia or co-op model, um, Title IV-A in particular around like ed tech and things like that. Uh, I would love to see more of that when it comes to thinking about what uh, assessments will, we can either create or curate that may already exist and then share, share the wealth because larger school systems are going to need them just as much as the rural systems. And they, the small systems may not have the capacity to develop those, but could take advantage of the things that are developed by larger or more or suburban kind of school systems. And that's where a lot of my work comes into play around open educational resources and being able to freely and openly share those resources and not having to worry about copyright involved in all of that. So I think that's really important for us to be able to partner with folks in order to help students. That's that's what we're here for. I think hearing Christina, both you and Kevin talking about this concept of collaboration and sharing best practices, could either one of you maybe shed some light on a conversation potentially between public, private, charter schools with sharing resources? Because some of the things that Christina, you were just mentioning with this like consortia model feels like a little bigger but maybe like what could it look like for a district or a state to have their public schools private schools and any of their charter schools sharing resources and best practices is that something that's worth exploring so maybe a more educate or a more equitable educational landscape could be achieved i would love to see that kind of collaboration um i know that in the state of Washington, they have a policy at their state level that requires anything that is created at the Department of Education or consultants that work for the Department of Ed to openly license all of the things that are created, meaning that it is available to anyone and everyone to be able to use. So that is private, public, charter, whatever that may be, um, but they're an anomaly. So <laughs> we'd like to see more of that. Um, but then you think about some of the states that have charters within a public school system. So DCPS, for example, California has a lot of this. It's kind of built into the local public school system that ask for a charter to be able, you know, to exist. And so I think there are kind of natural entry points for some of this collaboration, but it's also going to have to like spark conversation in order for that collaboration to happen. Um, most state departments don't necessarily like um, oversee private or parochial, so that may be a little bit harder to do. Um, but if Secretary DeVos has her way, which is the case right now about CARES Act funding potentially going to private schools, maybe that's a way that we can turn that into a positive, um, is that we can ask for those private schools to collaborate with public schools in all of this and share the resources and share the best practices. Um, the last thing I would say is that there are at least 25 different states that are involved with open educational resources and have some sort of kind of they're working in a community of practice with other states to share those resources and have repositories available to find those resources. So we know that those exist. So how can we continue to add to the repository and then make sure that everyone knows about those. So I have uh, probably a little bit of a different uh, uh, perspective on, on this. I think that, that uh, uh, I'll go back to, I, I really believe in the public education system that a community has an elected uh, board of trustees uh, that is accountable to the entire community and uh, that serves all children. 
And certainly public schools have not always lived up to that promise and, and have a lot of work to do on that. Uh, when it comes to charter schools, the idea of a charter being within uh, the, the auspices of a board of trustees or a community, uh, that is not the way it's done in Texas. So, uh, but in those states that do it that way, I can see that that would be, uh, there can be some real positive that comes out of that. And, and because again, they're accountable to the community through their elected representatives and it, that is democracy. And so I'm, I'm comfortable with that. I start getting worried when we don't have uh, democracy involved, uh, but that when we treat education as if it's a commodity instead of a public good. And, and I think that uh, uh, I'm all for open resources and I'm all for sharing of ideas. And I think there's a lot of that that goes on. Um, I just really believe in the system of having uh, uh, local elected leaders that your community has a say in what goes on. And I think when you don't have that over the long, time, over the long term, some of these inequities that we're talking about today can be exacerbated. Um, when uh, you have for-profit or private entities that don't have the best interest of the entire community, but what they want to do is find the right kids to serve who make the right test scores or the right grades. Um, and, not, and I'm not saying all private schools and all charter schools do that by any means, nor am I saying all public schools get that right, but at least a public school is accountable to the public. And I think that is a really important thing to do. Um, I've had family members in private school. I had a sister that went to private school for a period of time. So certainly don't fault anybody for uh, doing that. Um, I, I did not agree with uh, Secretary DeVos's decision uh, uh, as a, uh, to share public funds with private schools. I think if private schools wanna be public, then they ought to be public and then they can access public schools. The Title I part of that, I think, uh, uh, we've always shared with private schools that when there's low income students in private schools, they ought to be served. And even as a superintendent, we would do that with our local private schools. There just aren't a whole lot of low income kids going to private schools. When they, they do, it's typically to a Catholic school uh, or a, a, a parochial school like that. Um, and, uh, uh, but, but I'm not sure that we ought to be funding affluent kids going to private schools with public money, just generally. And uh, clearly I have kind of a, uh, a bias. I'm a, I'm a public ed guy that with a whole bunch of public ed people in my family, but uh, uh, being a government major who really believes in democracy and the power of education and serving that, I just worry about losing that accountability to the entire community. Thanks. I would also like to say that I'm a huge advocate for public schools. <laughs> I'm sure you I, don't are. Like I, don't I don't like to come across that I don't. I just no. trying to find the silver lining in that. So <laughs> that's happening. Totally understand. I know, Christina. <laughs> um, the next question I want to direct to LaShawn um, to start for her to start responding to. Um, there are a lot of discussions about wraparound services that students will need upon reentry. How do you see community partnerships helping that happen? What are some best practices to ensure kids have all their needs met, not just academic? Sure. I, I, I think um, obviously this is this is all already in, occurring in schools around the country. Schools um, have uh, advisory bodies. Um, where members of the community or business and local leaders can participate um, and um, also through different fundraising and sponsoring opportunities. So those, you know, initial kind of contacts have been made under what we'll call the normal circumstances. Um, so I think there is an opportunity to help to grow and nurture those relationships. Um, many communities across the country also have community coalitions that are working to improve the health of their communities. And they have representatives from um, community-based organizations, faith organizations, um, private business owners, um, and, and schools. Um, so not to add anything to the plate of um, teachers and staff who are already very busy, but I think um, many communities across the country have been working hard to kind of take ownership and um, uh, build 
healthier environments and um, environments that support well-being for their residents. So I think there are opportunities to connect to those. Um, like I said, there are already these existing connections in schools and um, local health departments are also often very engaged and under, represented on those coalitions, but also understanding the different coalitions um, that exist. Um, so I think we talked about, you know, um, underserved communities and, and communities face a number of challenges, but I think um, there are also, as we talked about before, strengths in communities um, that we can leverage. Um, and organizations who have been working uh, for decades um, to provide, you know, everything from food banks to clothing, um, referrals to different kinds of shelters and support services. Um, so I think those resources are there. Um, oftentimes, like I said, local health departments and others may have inventories or directories of those resources. So I think tapping in to some of those existing resources and exploring opportunities to, to further um, build and, and nourish those relationships. We have time, I think, for one more question um, in the next three minutes. So the last question that we have from the audience, how do we address the very real fact that in our current society, public schools serve not only as education, but also child care for working families. I'd be happy to defer to Dr. Glass Glasgow or Christina if you want. I'm happy to chime in though, but y'all go first if you'd like. <laughs> um, I, th I mean, we talked about, um, you know, com needs are, are going to vary by communities. And even the situation with folks returning to work, and we have folks who had to work all along throughout this crisis, right? So um, decisions we may make for the safety of students and, and staff can have some unintended um, consequences on those communities. You have people who are at risk of losing their job if they don't show up. They don't have any job security. Um, so they, they don't have the option um, to be able to be at home and support their kids with remote learning. Um, and that's on the side of low resources. Even folks um, who are have a more privileged um, kind of socioeconomic status like healthcare providers, well, they have to go to, to work. They're first responders and they have to help respond to the crisis. So they also are limited to the degree to which they can support remote learning. So I, I think in a number of ways, um, parents and families um, are needing a, a safe way to, to, to do re-entry, to send their kids to school so that they're able to take care of their work obligations. And even those of us who are privileged enough, as we all are, to be able to work from home right now, um, depending on your job, you may not have the flexibility to really support younger children um, in that remote learning. So I think there are, are a lot of considerations here. Um, and I think it kind of goes back to the questions, what are we requiring of our families and our students and our teachers? Um, who can, who is in a position to respond to that um, relatively easy? And who is this gonna create an added burden for? Um, and once we have a better sense of that, it's important to really, to the extent that it's within the school or school district's power to divert resources to where there's the most need. I would agree with what Dr. Glasgow said and just say, I think it was, uh, uh, schools definitely have a babysitting quality to them, a childcare quality to them, and the younger the child and the needier the child, the more important that is. And uh, I think she said that very well. That may require us to spread children out across school campuses, like not only using your elementary, but your middle and high school campus for elementary children. And the older you are, the more uh, children are staying at home. Um, and I'll end with that because I know we're out of time, Allison. <laughs> Thank you so much. I just want to say again to everyone who joined us for this conversation, thank you so much for spending your last hour with us. Uh, if you have any questions about RTI Center for Education Services, my contact information is on this screen, so please don't hesitate to reach out. Shane just dropped in the chat box a survey. Uh, we would love your feedback. This is the third of our three-part series about COVID-19 and education. 
And so we would love your feedback so that we can continue to provide helpful, beneficial information to you all in the future. Um, there will be a follow-up email that also comes out with a link to the video recording of this webinar and also the survey link with that. And we are just, again, so grateful that you spent the last hour with us, and we hope you'll join us again in the future. Thank you so much.